Ash Ola. Hi everyone, welcome to the symposium. Today we're lucky enough to have a film-based episode and I'm very happy to be joined by two of my friends, James and Jay, who are both kind of patrician film aficionados. So they'll be talking about the kind of films they've watched recently, what they're into, some other select films that they've watched and uh, perhaps some other ones that they'd like to watch in the future. So without further ado, um, if they'd like to introduce themselves, Jay. My name is Jay. I guess I started watching films like everyone else did when I was about 13. I saw Pulp Fiction <laughs> yeah. um, on the IMDb list. And then I think I went from there and I've seen, I think I've logged about 835 films, which is not as much as James, but I guess it's more than your average person. Far more, I'd say, yeah. I'm James. Uh, I found a bootlegged uh, DVD copy of Space Chimps in my attic <laughs> when I was when I hit puberty and um, <laughs> and really I experienced what can only be described as religious transcendence right um, and since then I've logged uh, around I think I don't know somewhere around 1700 films uh, on Letterboxd all of them um, directed by uh, Judd Apatow I'd like to just kind of gen- generally ask you both kind of what films you've watched recently over the last year or half year and what films stood out to you and what films you enjoyed or didn't enjoy and some that you'd just like to really talk about so Jay if you'd like to go first I'm going to start with a film that's not really a surprise to either of you two but the film that has stood out for me in the past year was Parasite right um and I can feel James rolling his eyes at that um it's obviously it won the best picture it was the first non-English language film to do so um I thought it was an absolute I think it's an absolute masterpiece I think it's the best film of the last year or so from what I've seen anyway um and I think it's I think the reason it works so well is because Mm. the film is just a complete roller coaster ride it's flawlessly executed it shifts up a couple of genres throughout its two hour or so runtime lands every single one perfectly I didn't really think it misses a note and I think it's a fantastic film uh James have you seen it yeah, I mean, I've seen it. It was it was good. I actually was at I was at the the world premiere. Actually, um, it was all right. It was good. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't think it's the I don't even think it's the best film of the last six months, let alone you know ever, as some people are saying. But um, but it was fun. It was okay. It was uh, accessible. <laughs> so I mean, that sounds like you don't particularly like it as much as Jay, because obviously Jay. But in the past has kind of spoken, given it a lot of high praise. He's kind of raved about it, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, what what reasons do you have for perhaps not considering it to be as revolutionary or kind of as groundbreaking, perhaps, as others do? I mean, look, I so the thing is, as well, I've, I've a, I have a general opinion that people's opinions on things are formed via um, partially by at least external information. Right. So when I. When I saw this film, no one else had seen the film. So I thought when I saw the film, hey, it's a good film. It's, you know, it's, it's good. Uh, I had a lot of fun, mm-hmm. um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it just never occurred to me during the film that this is in any way a masterpiece. You know, you just don't, there's a feeling that you get with some films and you don't get with other films, which is like, oh, this is, you know, pulling things in a new direction or it's doing already established things to such a high degree that, um, you know, it's just impossible to not see this being a fixture in people's lives in the future. And so it you wasn't, didn't, you, so it you wasn't didn't really get that. No. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, what, what I thought was it's a genre film that can, how interesting is what right. I thought. Right. Can okay. I, okay. That's, that's very fair. Yeah. Jay, do you want to chip in? Yeah, I do disagree. Um, I mean, so I watched it in December, I think. Mm. I watched it before it came out in cinemas in the UK. I watched it obviously before, I, I think I actually watched it just before it was nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, the, the Oscar nominations come out in January, I believe. Um, yeah. So I watched it before any of that happened. Um, yeah, but even I at knew, the time, nobody I, was shut the fuck up about it. I mean, yeah. even at the time, it was literally everywhere. I knew, I knew obviously from Cannes, but I mean, I'd seen enough films that had won the Palm d'Or that I didn't think much of, in the, especially in the past few years. Right. Um, for me. I do kind of agree with James at the start. I thought, okay, this is a very, this is just a very entertaining film. But then, obviously, I'm not going to spoil it. Halfway through, I, I was kind of just completely, you know, 
taken by surprise, thrown mm. it, and the I think the final half of the film just completely shook me. And then I watched it not too long ago with my dad after it won the Oscar. And it was actually my second viewing where I, was, I could kind of see everything fitting into place. And for me, just the execution was fine. Even if it had done stuff that other films had done in the past, I thought it was doing it a lot better than those films had. But do you think that perhaps some of your, I mean, obviously I can't know. And you have to you have to kind of judge this for yourself. But do you think that some of your opinions on it might have been impacted or affected by um external information the fact it won the oscar the fact that it had received a lot of hype and the fact that you were kind of rooting for it do you think all of that kind of contributed maybe rather than in terms of that james was able to james is lucky enough to perhaps see it in a vacuum which might lead to more of an objective opinion i mean potentially i mean you can never really tell with these things i mean to be honest more often than not so something winning best picture will be a reason for me to dislike the film I'll be, I, I usually use it as an opportunity to think, well, the Oscars were wrong again. Uh, here, I don't think they were wrong. Um, I yeah. certainly, at no point would I ever question the best director. I think James would agree with me on that. The I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely, I mean, the Oscars definitely aren't aren't a great um, indication. I mean, obviously, a lot of people would take that as an indication. But if you, if you have, you know, even a slight idea of what you're talking about, you just wouldn't go on that. But you look at something like, like Green Book, for instance. Green Book, mm. you know, it's not a good film. It's not a great film. It's an all right film. But nobody had really, you know, nobody was saying it was an incredible film or whatever. And then uh, a discourse emerged that it was somehow, you know, the worst film of all time, which is not because I've seen far worse films than Green Book, even in that year. You know what I mean? Mm. Then all of a sudden, everybody on the Internet thought that it was the worst film of all time. And it's patently not the worst film of all time. I mean, do you think that part of the kind of... um the kind of voting system that they have for best picture contributes to that kind of overall consensus pick that isn't that to avoid kind of controversy isn't exceptionally good which for some people would be exceptionally bad do you think that 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 is the kind of mechanism that leads to a film like green book winning which is solid but is uncontroversial in that sense oh yeah i mean only an only an uncontroversial film can win best picture i mean it's just how it works yeah i think kind of with a similar idea um so Parasite on Letterboxd, they've got a top 250 list. Parasite is now at number one. Mm. It's got the rating, the average rating is 4.6. And I do think to an extent of Parasite, it's one of those ones, as James says, it's a, it is a very accessible film. It's the kind of film that no one's going to watch it and think, I didn't enjoy that. Mm. Because just objectively, it is just a very entertaining film. Could you um, give an example, perhaps, of a film that therefore you think is really good but that other people would maybe struggle to enjoy or or other people have struggled to enjoy from from speaking to people i'm going to go with one it's not actually from speaking to people i'm going to go for one from the last year which mm. is it's probably the film i'd put as the second best is uh i probably am saying this wrong Bakaru. Uh, right did I, say, did I say that right uh Bakarau, maybe Bakarau. Bakarau. It's, right. Bakarau. Um, it's, could you give the kind of premise of it as well or? um i'm trying to think of how to give the first without spoiling it it's a brazilian film <laughs> It's, it's about, in two halves. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of in two halves. The basic idea is that it's about... Um, the, the first half is just about this small unknown town in Brazil that has for some reason disappeared off the maps, but it kind of turns into this weird kind of... almost like an action flick. Um, it's also in both English and Portuguese. Uh, that's probably as much as I can say, but the right. film is... Even when I was watching the film, I, I was actually messaging James, messaging James at the time. I was like, I don't think I like this. I don't think I like this. And then it ended. I was like, I loved that. That was fantastic. Um, mm. It's one of those films that it kind of goes off the rails a bit, but in a way that actually makes sense within kind of the grander scheme of what the film's trying to do. Right. So how do you think that contributes to perhaps some people not uh, maybe appreciating it the same way or being or, or how does that contribute it to being to it being characterized as less accessible than Parasite? Well, Bakaru, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to it. I wouldn't recommend it to many people because I think right, probably rightfully so they'd watch it and suddenly it's, halfway. Go look, it's ideologically hard. I mean, yeah. you know, something like Parasite, what's the ideology? Capitalism is bad. Oh, right. right. Well done, monkey. Okay. Clap, clap. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Bakaru yeah. is making Bakaru is like about makes, US intervention in in third states. Yeah, mm. but you don't even realize it really until kind of quite late into the film. Mm. Where and like, it's done, these, it's done quite cleverly, but it doesn't yeah. spell it. It doesn't spell it out for you at all. 
So for I the mean, casual, even... so for the casual West, Western listener, is it kind of uncomfortable in that you have to confront perhaps ideology which has permeated your state and the history of your state in the last few decades? I think it's more likely that if this film was to be, if it got a release, for instance, say in Cineworld, it's more likely that people would watch it and not have a clue what was going on than right. they would be confronted by it. Right. Okay. Which is a shame as well because it's actually a very enjoyable film mm. as well. It kind of it kind of starts again. I'm trying not to spoil things, but it kind of starts as this small town, third world kind of country drama, and then it has this kind of western action film kind of imposed onto it. Yeah, and it feels really weird, but it works completely, and they it's executed brilliantly. Okay, so I mean, James, I'd like to kind of refocus back on something you said earlier about when you were describing Parasite. Because you said that some some films kind of jump out at you as, as kind of ex- instant classics that through whatever kind of innovation in the film itself is something that would that you you'd always recognise as a quality film. Can you give an example of one um, in the sense that because you said Parasite wasn't an example of that, could you give an could you give an example of a film that was? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess from from this year, there's a film called uh, Emma by Pablo Lorraine. Right. And what what you see with this film is that it's like a complete reinvention. It's like a new cinematic grammar being developed. Mm. Like the, the ideas, your traditional idea of narrative, your idea uh, of structure, your idea of what it's possible to do in a story that's ostensibly real are completely thrown out the window. It pushes, you know, the concept of reasonable budget filmmaking in a new direction and when you watch this you're like you know something so sort of restlessly endlessly inventive that i'm just not going to find this elsewhere and when you're watching it or when i was watching it like all i could think was this is you know this is a classic in the making so so was it Um, the kind of writing and the non and perhaps a non-linear or subversive plot or was it the kind of the acting which was which was distinctively you know ironic or I mean, the, the, the writing, I mean, the writing's, the writing's good, I guess, and the, the acting's good as well. But it's like, a, it's hard to explain. It's like the reconceptualization of a narrative film as the best way I can put it as a sort of a dance sequence. The entire film kind of plays out like a, a sort of abstract impressionistic dance routine, although the characters are not dancing the whole time. Mm. The point is that the flow of the narrative, A, B, C, is disrupted. It's not linear. It's not nonlinear. It's it's just uh, deeply unconventional. It's like impressionistic. Mm. It's a narrative that plays out via abstract images as opposed to uh, via you know normal exposition. And the narrative that does play out is deeply unconventional. It's not um, necessarily something that you would you know you would you would just instinctively understand. It's almost like uh, there's a bit of Medea to it, but it's not really Medea. So, so is that more satisfactory for you as a watcher than perhaps a film that does a classic format brilliantly? Is the fact that it's new more satisfying? I mean, the fact that it's new is 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 definitely for me more satisfying just because you see the same thing again and again a lot. Um, mm. But, you know, there are films that do the same thing again and again and do it very well. You know, something like um, I know we all like Uncut Gems, something like that is essentially just a Robert Altman film. Right. But, it's done very well or something like portrait of a lady on fire. It's not like we haven't seen a film like that before, but it's done incredibly well. Um, so films that do things, you know, very well are, are fine, but it's a lot more memorable to see, uh, you know, 100 year old or 120 year old art form being taken in a new direction. Jay, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're kind of going back to what we said about accessibility. I mean, I've seen Emma as well. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a good film. I think it's the kind of film that would probably benefit from a repeat viewing on my part. Right. Whereas something like Uncut Gems, I liked it a lot. I don't think I'm necessarily rushing to watch it again. Mm. Um, So I can kind of see what James is saying in terms of, you know, Emma might be the kind of film that maybe grows on you, whereas Uncut Gems, you know, it's, it's a good film. It's a, it's a very good film. It's got some great acting, especially from Adam. But it's not the kind of experience I'm like, okay, all right, I need to sit. I don't finish it and think, right, I have to watch that again. The second and, I finish it, it. and is that because, you know, although it's done very well with the music and the score and everything that encourages that kind of feeling of anxiety, essentially the premise of 
and, and the plot is essentially still orthodox and you've therefore seen it enough times that you don't feel like you'll gain anything extra by watching it again or yeah i mean maybe maybe again maybe i'll change my opinion think in a year's time and think oh i could do with watching uncut gems again but it's the kind of film where i thought because i thought like everything in uncut gems is building on the anxiety of what's going to happen hmm. and i'm not necessarily convinced that after you know what happens whether it will still have the same effect well for me i mean i kind of had that to the extent that i knew what happened in real life with the basketball game so yeah. so from that perspective as soon as i won't give any spoilers right but as soon as i kind of knew that he was betting or whatever outcome of that i kind of knew then that, that he would essentially you know whatever the result of the bet would be which i guess made it different for you considering that you wouldn't have been as familiar with the basketball itself i didn't have a clue didn't that's, that's one basketball. that's one way of doing it <laughs> i really noticed on my second viewing of it how much uh, effort the script went into to explain how basketball works <laughs> it's like the um what's the what's uh what's his uh i don't know how you say like the, the person that works in his store what's the actress's name that was one it's of her so first films i think yeah yeah it is her first i think she's a porn actress um she she <laughs> As an she, I think she actually was born actress. Um, she asks the guy like, "What does that mean?" Ju- Julia, guy, Fox. This is Julia Fox. Yeah, Julia Fox. She asks the guy in the casino, "What does that mean?" And the guy's like, "This is what it means." <laughs> <laughs> so what did uh, the exposition put you off? No, no, I didn't notice it till the second time around. I know, look, I know nothing about basketball. I need the exposition. You know what I mean? Or else I, I have no idea how the film's going. Um, I don't think it's. I don't necessarily think the the case is that you know I knew what was going to happen or I know what's going to happen. It diminishes it. It's just that uh, films, you know, they ride in on waves of hype and the uncut gems wave will end and something else will begin. You know, if we didn't have coronavirus, we we'd already have had Cannes. We'd be going into Venice and TIFF, and then we'd be going back into Sundance, and there would be new films. There'd be a new wave. Everyone would forget about this last year's stuff you know this is how it works mm. there's always hype films uh in the crossover sort of uh market um there always has been always will be and you know they get forgotten and then the next one's the next big thing and then you know so it's... do you have so i mean based on that i know i know based on that then you're kind of saying that we're kind of focusing on films from last year that you know in a way that we perhaps wouldn't if we weren't in the time of coronavirus but mm. are there certain films that you that, that that do from last year other than the ones you mentioned really stick out to you either for good or bad reasons either of you i was gonna say i, I only watched it what, about a week ago but pain and glory by pedro almodovar um so he's a director my spanish teacher introduced me to him because she was obsessed with the guy very good comedic, very good comedic films yeah well exactly and what i found interesting is this is his obviously his most recent film but it was very different from his other films in the sense that they're normally, if anyone's seen his films, they're normally just completely wacky and normally quite funny. Um, this was a lot more kind of serious in tone and a lot more mature, mm. but it was kind of interesting to see the growth of this director. It was probably his best made film. I don't think it was his best film. I think it's the one he did the best job at directing. Mm. Uh, you've also got Penelope Cruz playing a young mother because she's Penelope Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she looks like she can. It was it was a really good film, uh, an enjoyable watch. I think that to me, I mean, I, I'm a fan of his anyway, but I think for me that is a film that will stand out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot, last year. Look, I think last year was a great year. Um, there was so much shit that came out last year that I just love. There's a film called Long Days Journey Into Night, which is just absolutely Ooh, was incredible. That, last year? that was last year. Yeah, yeah that's December. an incredible film. I gave that five stars. James, um, do, you want to talk, do you want to talk about that film? Yeah, I mean, there's this uh, Chinese director, Began, and he's made two films, and both films are, um, he was a poet before he was a filmmaker, right. and both films he sort of tries to, again, it's, an, it's another reinvention of narrative structure. So in the first film, uh, I, I can't remember the, the exact framework plot, but essentially it involves the protagonist coming to uh, his, old, his old town, and whilst he's in the town, he sort of falls into this dream state, and during the dream state, uh, which takes place in a sort of 40 minute one take scene, the past, the present and the future are all happening at the same time. But it's done very it's done very minimalistically, almost so, such that you wouldn't notice unless you were paying attention. Mm. With this film, uh, it sort of spin the first half sort of spins a very fractured uh, kind of neo-noir plot, you know, involving, uh, you know, a femme fatale, lost loves, et cetera, et cetera. 
But then in the second half, well, right at the halfway point, the main character falls asleep. And then the second half is sort of his subconscious trying to make sense of the fractured plot of the first half. Um, and it's how one that, take. How that plays out is in a 3D one take. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, an exceptional... exceptional a 1917 plot. Birdman one take or an actual, actual one take? No, no, an actual, 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 actual one take. Right, okay, right, that's different. Because uh, obviously, Jay and I went towards 1917 and... Yeah, it's such uh, a joke, such a joke. And we were, like, movie. under the impression it would be... Uh, kind of one take in the literal sense of the word but it obviously yeah. if she wasn't <laughs> why is this camera zooming into <laughs> a bush and then freezing on the bush <laughs> i wonder <laughs> for what me the, the, doing. <laughs> for me the biggest issue was there was literally a scene in 1917 where the film kind of goes to black yeah. and then it kind of <laughs> and wakes up again a like, few hours but later as far yeah. as i'm concerned this is a cut that's this yeah, is literally that's a, cut. a cut yeah oh. you know uh, it's not even like it's it's not even like kind of it going into a bush and kind of doing Harry a Hall. bad transition. Yeah. This was just objectively a cut in the film. I mean, the movie is literally just a Call of Duty tutorial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, for an hour and a half. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, Long Day's Journey tonight was good. Ooh. There's a film called Sunset by Laszlo Nemesh, the guy who did Son of Saul. Right. Um, and the movie's thesis is... Um, it's on my watch list. I haven't seen it. The movie's thesis is about like a sort of postmodern approach to history whereby you can't define history by timeline you know it's not like france it's about the start of, of the war so it's not like you can't just say france Ferdinand was shot and the war started it's about how you can be um an individual and you can be you can stop becoming an individual essentially and become part of history and the film is shot very experimentally to show almost like a horror film as uh you wonder it's almost shot in first person over the you know it's over the shoulder of the protagonist as she sort of wanders around Budapest as the Austro-Hungarian Empire kind of collapses in on itself. Um, and there's all these sort of mysterious forces swirling around. There's like hints of the occult. Um, and it all, you know, it all comes together in, uh, shall we say, shocking fashion. That sounds um, I thought, very, very weirdly similar to a book I read uh, at the start of lockdown called Beware of Pity by Stefan Zweig, which although it lack, lacks bits, bits of the occult and supernaturalism, it's about kind of human interactions and and surprising turn of events in the fallout of the um, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in, this, in the First World War. And it just that just the way that you described that film there, the premise of it just reminded me of that. And it's a beautifully written book. So I would recommend you read it if you enjoyed that film, based, based at least on your own characterization yeah. of the film. Um, but yeah, Jay, you had something to add. I was just going to say, I was just looking over Let's Box. One film, it, it's a basic answer, but it's one film I do think is going to stand the test of time. It's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, I thought oh, it was okay. Tarantino's best film since Pulp Fiction. I'd go so far to say I might even one day come to say it's better than Pulp Fiction. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is Tarantino, uh, his most mature. He wasn't. It wasn't kind of tacky, which some of his films maybe feel a little bit, especially Django. It felt they kind of feel more like an imitation. Here, it kind of felt like he actually had his own voice and he had something to say. Hmm. Um, and I felt like he was doing kind of the, you know, the alternative history thing, but instead of doing it to kind of shock people, he was doing it here to actually make a point about the overall idea of the film. Yeah, um, and I, yeah. I did like, I, I like the fact, that I think I really agree with your maturity point, because there were really kind of nice subtle elements, you know, the incongruousness of, of, of like the music, which was actually yeah. from after the film was set, you know, being played in the car, stuff like that, which you notice afterwards. Um, mm. which kind of overall contribute to to an actual coherent point because I think not even in, in, in a nihilist sense but in a general kind of immature sense he sometimes engages in gratuitous violence just for the sake of it sometimes and I feel yeah. that and I feel that especially in certain films like Kill Bill Volume 2 it, it's not really going anywhere at all um, whereas I think yeah as I, I agree with you in terms of Hollywood it, it seems like he's actually trying to make a coherent statement about the film industry I mean James you yeah. had something to add yeah I mean, I thought, yeah, I mean, I thought it was, it was a, you know, incredible film. Um, again, very Altman-esque. Uh, but yeah, I really thought this was the first time that, you know, the level of violence had a philosophical point to make about, you know, yeah, a, com- agree, totally. a conflict, a conflict between reality and our, our perceived reality and the power of cinema. Um, and I thought, honestly, the ending is really powerful to that film. Mm. Um, it's not just like, aha, lol, uh, you know, dog bite cock. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. like 
there's there's a there's a really solid point to be made there and it's yeah. it's a really sad film um but it's you know i thought it was very well done i mean linking to another director who has massively who has a massive fan base and, and a load of kind of almost cult following but almost a director who is now endorsing a a model which tarantino probably dislikes i think we can go to the irishman by martin scorsese which came out on netflix i think that's where most people have seen it at least i mean i wondered what either of your thoughts were on that it is um, crap. <laughs> I, James and I both share the opinion that, that The Irishman is just not a very good film. Right. It's, it's a three hour long, straight to it's DVD. four hours long. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's four hours long. It's basically roughly the plot of Goodfellas without with like kind of the filmmaking of Godfather Part 3, the excitement oh value of the Godfather Part 3. Oh and it's no. also half an hour longer. And it's just, it's boring the cgi boring. is the cgi is weird it woeful. completely takes you out it's of the film woeful. i'd say okay to be fair to it the first hour is quite good okay um, there's some stuff in the first hour i think towards the end it's just getting really bad i thought al pacino was awful in it joe pesci was good as always i mean he's yeah. joe pesci he doesn't really he, he's always good i mean he can play he's himself, himself in these kind of he's films. playing himself yeah yeah, yeah. yeah he, he was good he was good I mean, I was um, going to say, though, like, Peter, it's like someone like Bradshaw in The Guardian, though, was lauding it, giving it five stars, you know, calling look, it seminal. And I wondered look, how you're you attention that. to criticism. Peter Bradshaw gives every high profile crossover film five stars. Right. <laughs> I mean, I he gets it's... the new Spike Lee film five stars and it's shit. Is it I mean, five it's, Five Bloods? Defy yeah, Bloods I mean, or? it's absolute crap. It's like a right. straight to DVD adventure it's I so saw, bad i saw the trailer for that and it looked very intriguing just because i'm a massive fan of kind of vietnam war films when they're done well like full metal jacket trailer, topics now the trailer is much better than the film right okay the that, film that, that's is so bad annoying. No, it's the like trailer, a lifetime channel movie the trailer encouraged me to watch it um but now you've given that kind of scathing review i'm not sure if i, I know will. i know you like apocalypse now as well and it's a massive just rip off of apocalypse now like legit, like at the end, like the character, the main character is lying on the floor and he looks at the camera and he's like, he says it exactly the same tenor as uh, Martin Sheen. He goes, madness, madness. And oh, it's like, no. did you get it? Did you get it? <laughs> the, the, the very start of the film takes place in a bar in Vietnam. The bar is literally called Apocalypse Now. And as if you didn't get it, when they're dancing in the bar, the Apocalypse Now poster is behind them, like on the screen. <laughs> oh, I mean, God, Jay, you, Jay, you read... Jay, you read Heart of Darkness not that long ago. Yes. How do you feel I, the adapt? I, I mean, I, I personally consider Apocalypse Now to be an example of a film that that betters the book dramatically. I mean, I'm sure you agree. I completely agree. Um, I thought Heart of Darkness was it was well written. It was I found the first kind of 30 pages, so the first chapter. I mean, it's only it's only about what 70, 70 pages, pages long. Yeah. The first chapter I found was actually was a good was a good read. And then after that, I felt that the book didn't really kind of it just kind of kept doing the same thing. It just kind of kept describing the jungle and the journey. And I found the Kurtz character in the book was actually really uninteresting and really kind of undeveloped on. Mm, I think that's kind of though, I think just to, to I kind of offer a devil's advocate. I think that's why people like it in some sense, because I don't want to spoil the book. I mean, although it's been out for 100 years, so you probably should have read it by now. <laughs> um, um, but, but essentially, in the final scene, you have the protagonist talking to Kurtz's wife. And that scene and the fact that Kurtz is quite an ambiguous character, yeah. I think is what people like about the book, because they can then discuss it and perhaps impose their own understanding. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, it's kind of hard when you read a book after having seen a film, especially a film like Apocalypse Now, which I've revered for years, because obviously you go yeah, I mean, with your kind of we, preconceived we ideas. We agree. Yeah, we agree. It's probably my favourite film, actually. But yeah. Do, I mean, do you have much else to add about the kind of... Well, I mean, as, as more of a general point, do you have much else to add about what do you think makes a really good adaptation of source material? I mean, it, it depends on the source material, you know. I mean, some source material... So, for instance, if you're saying, I've not read Heart of Darkness, although I'm aware that so many books I've read and so many films I've seen are pretty much direct rip-offs or <laughs> at least directly inspired by Heart of Darkness. If the book's going to be ambiguous, then, you know, you're going to have to add something to it. I think yeah. if the book's incredibly complex, then you can delve away. But there's there's no, 
I don't think there's any framework. For instance, if you look at Lynn Ramsey, what she did with uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin and with uh, You Were Never Really Here, essentially she took novels that were not mincing words, were shit. I mean, they were like uh, complete, you know, airport uh, airport paperbacks read by imbeciles. Right. And she completely, she completely fractures them, uh, you know, turns them into sort of collages of abstract images as opposed to... Um, these kind of weepy stories or these or these standard thrillers or if you look what uh alex garland did to annihilation annihilation is an adventure story but alex garland added a lot of subtext and themes that weren't there um so i think you know it's 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 in general up to people to decide what they want to do uh and some things like for instance if you're going to adapt something like lord of the rings or harry potter then the, the fan base is going to expect you to uh, turn out a religious uh, kind of adherent adaptation. Mm. But most of the time, I think it pays to take liberties. I yeah, mean, Jay, Jay, we spoke about, sorry to interrupt you, I mean, we spoke briefly about um, There'll Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson, which is based on source material, but which you told me that he kind of rewrote himself or essentially took a lot of liberties with. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's an example of perhaps the uh, it's similar to how James describes we need to talk about Kevin, perhaps a film being taking its artistic license and perhaps improving upon the source material or taking it in a completely different direction. Uh, well, it's kind of hard to say because obviously I've never read Oil. I have no no idea about the book. Um, as far as I'm aware, I think my understanding is that Paul kind of took the idea of Daniel Plainview and Oil Man, and then he basically made. I mean, if you really, if you watch. Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography. I mean, I know you saw The Master the other day. Yeah. Pretty much all his films follow. There's normally some kind of weird version of kind of a father-son relationship in almost all of his films. And he basically brings that framework into, I guess, this oil narrative. And obviously, I guess he probably took the ideas up, kind of the, the ideas of kind of the building of America, of capitalism, maybe of religion from the book. But I couldn't say whether he improved it, obviously, because I've not read the mm. book myself. Oil's, uh, it's like a non-fiction book though, isn't it? Mm. Is it? Yeah, I think it's been widely, like, it's it's not necessarily that the book is, uh, the film is like an adaptation of Oil. It's just that Paul Thomas Iverson became obsessed with the book Oil and decided to make a book about, a film about, because I think the oil. thesis of Oil is about the, the <laughs> foundations of modern capitalism. And he was just right. like, let's just make yeah. this kind of modern foundational myth. Um, yeah, I can I can yeah. see that because of some of the kind of, entrepreneurial or just kind of risk-taking aspects of it that you see or, or that just you near know, the, the venture capitalist aspects of it that you see with the resettlement of like kind of new oil wells etc that might indicate some kind of themes about the original american west or themes about original market capitalism especially with the kind of predatory kind of buying of land around places to monopolize your interest i think there is a lot of you can you, there's a lot you can get from all that um i guess i'd like to take the take the kind of what we're talking about now to more general stuff about films that you've seen perhaps not really in the last year or so but more generally that you'd like to talk about whether for good or bad i mean jay would you like to start i'm, I'm going to talk about a film here that james knows i like ash knows i like james has seen it james has seen it in can although he's not seen it in can in the same way that i've seen it it's irreversible right it's I, it's kind of at the top of my rewatch list, which if you do watch it, you'll understand that that's quite a weird thing to say. Could you explain um, the kind of premise of it and who it's by, just for people so, who haven't heard of it? Of course. So it's by Gaspar Noé. It stars Monica Bellucci and Vincent Cassel. Right. It's basically, the basic idea is it's a rape and revenge film. Mm-hmm. But it's filmed backwards. Mm-hmm. So basically the film opens up at the end and it ends with the start of the story okay and it's starts the first kind of 45 minutes is probably the most nauseating terrifying most genuinely disturbing violent film you'll ever see and then it kind of switches gears and becomes this absolutely kind of crushing devastatingly sad film in the set in the final half Mm-hmm. And I think what's brilliant about it is because of the way it's structured, it takes what would normally be, and this is kind of what James says about kind of reinventing the, the idea of film, by flipping the film backwards, it takes what is, you know, a standard a standard violent film and makes it into this kind of brilliant tragedy. I mean, uh, James, have you, you said you saw that at Cannes. 
I saw any... Ven- I, yeah. At Venice, they uh, this last year because oh, sorry, uh, Venice. Venice. It's some sort of it's some sort of anniversary, maybe the fifteenth anniversary. They released this thing. It was a bit of a slight gimmick. They did a reversed cut. Mm-hmm. So, because the film's played in reverse, so they played it the right way around. Uh, it's a very different film because uh, when you play it in reverse, it's Gaspar Noe intended it to basically be a, a sort of off the wall adaptation of 2001: A Space Odyssey, um, which is sort of about human evolution. Uh, you know, instead of instead of the 2001, the hackneyed idea that uh, violence is what pushes uh, pushes us forward or what pushes us forward, uh, he was trying to say that you know, in reality, violence just pushes us back. Uh, you know, loving and caring for one another would be a true route towards uh, a sort of nirvana or, you know, anyway, when you play in in the right way around, it just turns into a sort of nauseating. <laughs> um, it just turns into really hard to watch, uh, nauseating exploitation film. Um, but that's fine. <laughs> like the first, the first 20 minutes or so of the film, I mean, talking about kind of a violent, nauseating film, I think makes this film so hard to appreciate because it is there are there's kind of there's in the score which is by the one of the guys from Daft Punk there are sounds designed to make you feel sick and I think it's and the cinematography of, is uh yeah it's schizophrenic like flying all over the place it's really really like a really hard opening to a film and I think it creates this barrier but I think once you get past it you get kind of past how violent it is, you can appreciate that there is a fantastic film in here. Like, I do think it's one of those films that kind of offends people to such an extent that they kind of don't see it for what it is. They kind of, you know, refuse to appreciate that it's actually a very good, very well-made film. Mm. I mean, James, do you have another one that you'd like to talk about? There's, you know, there, there are so many films. Um, I guess I could, I could bring people's attention to a film that's coming out later this year, probably. Uh, called Last and First Men by uh, the late Icelandic, you'll know him more as a composer, uh, Johan Johansson. Right. Um, he composed music for, uh, for instance, for Arrival uh, from Mandy, if you saw Mandy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he made, he's made this film uh, based on one of the sort of foundational modern science fiction novels, uh, I think from 1930, right. uh, which was a massive inspiration, I think, to Isaac Asimov. Um, anyway, the, the the sort of uh, the concept of the novel, which is I think quite a genius concept, is that uh, the novel itself is a sort of um, message which you, the reader, have been like psychically drawn to uh, from future generations of humans, or like the final generation of humans, like through many evolution cycles into the future, mm-hmm. and it's sort of a message as humanity is on the verge of extinction, back from them to you. And Johan Johansson has made this very interesting film where essentially he's uh, he's filmed these, uh, you know, in post-Soviet um, Europe, they created all these bizarre sort of neo-brutalist monuments, which are now just basically abandoned in the middle yes. of nowhere. Yes. So he's he's filmed these in uh, black and white 16 millimeter. And it looks mm. absolutely fantastic. He's put this titanic, like crushing score because <laughs> that's just wow. what he's known for over the top. And then the story is like narrated by Tilda Swinton, and it's like, oh, okay, it's just an incredible experience. It's when like, you put it like that, it sounds quite intriguing. It's like it's tra- also it's really like, short as well. It's seventy three minutes or something. Yeah, it's like trans. It's transcendent. I mean, it's like being you. You know, you stare at this. You know, the the sound is just like it's crushing. Do you know what um, it sounds like to some extent? Just because of the length of it and the fact it's kind of black and white, it sounds like Persona. Because apparently, because that's that's black and white. Obviously, it's not particularly long film. But I mean, I, I've not seen, I've not, but I've not seen um, obviously this this new film that you're talking about. So I couldn't couldn't compare. But I mean, how do you think it compares? Is, I is, mean, Persona is a much more uh, complicated, and I think it's a much more interesting movie. I mean, this is more of a, it's like a a very singular experience. I mean, mm. this is like basically being sat down being existentially torn apart whilst looking at uh very nice images and having this insane score like pumped all around you it's well, like so is it your whole existence being torn apart essentially <laughs> jay james is it kind of like 
it sounds almost like the first kind of three minutes of Persona, but for the entire yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, so much. the first three minutes of Persona is just weird visuals that make no sense with like a really really strong kind of like really kind of intense swore going on, hmm. but then the the rest of the film is almost it's almost just it's basically just a monologue for the entire film. Yeah. Um, but it's it's what is I've seen it probably about five times now. I still don't think I fully understand it. Um, mm. I think there are bits in the film that you're just never going to understand because it's so abstract. It's it's a fantastic film, though. Mm. Well, I mean, I think the film that I'd like to perhaps add in from one that I've that I've seen recently, but but came out a long time ago. I, I rewatched recently Doctor Strange Love by Stanley Kubrick, and um, I really enjoyed it. Not just merely because of like the obvious kind of political imagery or or the kind of political messages it's sending about perhaps the Cold War or or kind of uh, nuclear armament. But just because of the I think the writing just kind of really stood out, whether it's the irony or or just kind of the demonstration of kind of ridiculousness of some of the situations, as well as perhaps almost that Monty Python-esque um, kind of use of ordinary language for what is a profoundly weird situation. I think that's what really stood out to me about the film. And I know that Jay's a really massive fan of it as well. I mean, Jay, would you like to talk a bit more about that? I mean, yeah, I pretty much agree with everything you've said. I think it's. A fantastic satire also what we were talking about before about adaptations again i've never read it but it's based on a book called red alert which is a thriller novel mm. and kubrick read it and thought well you know what to be honest this kind of whole cold war idea is when you think about it it's kind of hilarious and he turned it into a satire mm. um i think to me actually i think the best part of the film is it's the final two minutes it's uh, do i spoil it no i mean okay yeah to be fair it's been out for ages so it's, it's been, been out for a while, while. <laughs> Um, I think the use of Vera Lynn's All Meet Again over nuclear bomb sequence is just genius. Mm. I, think, I think Kubrick's always had a good way of using music, but I think this is probably the best thing he's done, except for maybe the use of singing in a rainy clock like orange. I think this is his best musical moment in a film. Mm. I do know, however, that James isn't such a fan. James? I mean, I know. I think, I think it's a great film. I don't think it's like uh, his best film or... Uh, if I was to like, you know, rank the the more popular Kubrick site, like, it wouldn't be in the top three or four. Right. Um, so would you but like, I think could it's you give, really good. Could you give? Could you give? So, like, what is your favorite Kubrick film? Well, two thousand and one. Oh, is wonder. my favorite. Is it yeah, 2001? What could it be? What could it be? Uh, yes, yeah, two thousand and one. Um, okay. But I think you know, I think that uh, you know, going chronologically back, I think Eyes Wide Shut's a better film. I think uh, Clockwork Orange is a better film. I'd agree I with think, Clockwork Orange. I honestly think Full Metal Jacket's a better film. Mm. Um, I think The Shining's a better film than than uh, Strange Love. But Strange Love's a great film, honestly. I have no I have no problem with it. Do you do you? But you prefer 2001 to all of those, so you prefer it to Clockwork yeah, yeah, Orange or sure. Full Metal Jacket. And is there any for particular sure. reason, or just is it because I mean, of the, almost the just, cultural influence as well as the film itself? No, I mean, I saw, I think I saw it when I was 10 or 12 or something um, in the cinema and it was like, ah, holy shit. And I've seen it, I've seen it since a couple of times in the cinema, including in, on, on a 70, one of the New York 70 millimeter prints, which was just insane. I mean, the movie's just insane. You, you've never seen a, a, movie, a movie with that budget, which is like that, like ever, mm. uh, especially not one that looks like it could have been made yesterday. I mean, it just looks, you know, the, the, it hasn't aged at all. Nothing about it is aged um and the message hasn't aged it's just completely timeless mm. see i mean I, I probably put 2001 towards the bottom end of cubic's kind of accepted masterpieces right because oh listen i think the final hour or so is fantastic for mm-hmm. me i could kind of take or leave the first the first half of the film that's brutal, Jay, to be fair. I, I think that the whole brutal. film's outstanding. I could, I love the scene <laughs> with the Blue Danube, you know, the space, yeah. the first time you see yeah, space. Obviously. I mean, other yeah. than that, it's... You need the first half, because it puts you me, in the mood. One, of course, but I think one of the issues I always find with Kubrick, and I think it's particularly true in 2001, is there is some absolutely dreadful writing at the start of the film. You know, oh, with, I, um, I, I can't remember his name. The guy, when he's going... Uh, the guy who's not Dave, the guy going to the moon base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some what's, what's the dialogue wrong with is 
It just what? makes me cringe. It's just what? it's full What's of wrong with it? It's fine. Jay, it is, is it fine. because you're just Jay, you need to be nightly. Like, you're just such a cynical person. Come on, open your know. heart. For me, there's, the there's something fine. about it that's it's just so, what's bland. he do? He talks so he talks to the starter. He Jay, talks he just, to the starter on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bland, yeah, literally, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but like it's not uninteresting. It's important. But when I talks to the to the second half of the film, I don't think it's it's I don't even think it's in the same league. I mean, is that, just like, cause, is that just because there's no dialogue in the second half? <laughs> Maybe the second half of the film is just it's more interesting. I think it's better made. I think if you actually compare the some of the special effects in the first half to the second half, I don't think they hold up as well. Hmm. What? Why? The I've actually never heard. It's very interesting. Oh, this is very interesting because I've never actually heard someone break up 2001 in this way. Actually. Yeah, neither. Because it's in like four parts or three parts. Yeah. <laughs> Like the so, first half. What I'm basically saying is parts one and two I don't like as much as parts three and four. Right. Okay. No, I mean, fair enough. I mean, but you then so you'd say that something like Full Metal Jacket or Clockwork Orange are better than Jay. Yes, I would. I'd say Again, Okay. I'd say a Clockwork Oh no, I wouldn't say Clockwork Orange is his best film. I don't actually know what I would say is his best film at this moment. I kind of do need to do a full rewatch of all of his filmography. But I mean I mean could you could you give some idea as to why those couple of films are better than 2001 in your view? For me, A Clockwork Orange is kind of just, it's more consistent. It's its fantastic throughout. There's theres not really one scene I could point out and go, oh my God, this is incredible. Whereas with 2001, all I really talk about is Stargate. I think that's the best part of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, a Clockwork Orange, it's, you know, you've got Alex's story. It's interesting. There's kind of good parallels between the start and the finish. There's the prison bit is very good. The whole Ludovico technique is very good. The Shining, it's consistently great throughout the whole film. I think there's this brilliant foreboding sense of kind of anxiety that builds throughout the whole film and it genuinely creates this terrifying atmosphere. Full Metal Jacket, you've got a film that's, I mean, it's completely broken up into two parts. I think both parts are brilliant and I think both parts balance each other perfectly in the framework of the film. 2001, I'm not as convinced. Well, I mean, that's what we like then. I guess just disagreement. I mean, James, would you like another chance to defend your favourite? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't need to. It's okay. <laughs> no, okay. His, history will vindicate me. I mean, I'd say. I mean, Jay, you probably do accept that the 2001s probably had a more clear impact on popular culture more generally. Yeah, like don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not calling 2001: A Space Odyssey a bad film. I'm, <laughs> I'm not even calling it a good film. It's a very good film. It's it's probably a great film. I'm just, I, I don't know if I consider it to be a masterpiece in the right. same way that everyone else does. Maybe, to us, maybe this is like kind of what we were saying at the start, where you have this film that's so culturally revered that you watch it and you kind of want to backlash against it. Maybe mm-hmm. that is what's happening, I don't know. But for me, I, I do just find, I find myself uninterested in the first kind of half of the film. Mm. well i mean that and kind it's, of it's only really the second half where it starts entering my mind thinking but instead in the second so in the first half i think okay some of this is impressive but in the second half i think oh this is really good and i think that's for me is an important you, distinction you need to see it you need to see it in the cinema so that your yeah uh, that your attention is held game, i think mm. if i watch it in cinema it'd probably be a game changer you know but i haven't seen it in cinema so i can't say as i say i mean i said this the other day but i think I'm not going to spoil it, but I think in Twin Peaks series three, there is something that completely just obliterates the Stargate in every way, shape and form. Right. I mean, do you think that perhaps seeing it in the cinema, though, will have a similar effect to the effect you had when you saw Apocalypse Now, Final Cut or Redux, which you didn't like? No. I mean, hey, I mean maybe. I mean, to be honest, I never saw Final Cut in cinema so of Apocalypse Now. Right. So yeah. Think... No, you saw it. You saw it recently on TV. I saw it at home, yeah. Yeah. But you didn't like it? Well, it's not that I didn't like it. It's the... I don't like the French plantation scene. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. It's the yeah. French plantation. It's My issue is because I think the original part of Apocalypse... I think Apocalypse Now is one of those films that relies on... Okay, so let's put this When I watch Apocalypse Now, it's one of the few films where I actually do actively turn my phone off because I think everything about it requires you to be kind of slowly sucked into kind of the narrative and what's going on and like the atmosphere of the film and for me that French scene just breaks it <laughs> and then it happens in between two really important events and it ruins which is because I think 
I said this to James after watching it. I think there's a really good burial scene in the French plantation scene, which is great. It's just they could, then there's a dinner scene, which is really long, really boring and a bit preachy. Yeah, when they first arrive, away. when they first yeah, arrive, it's, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I saw it, just, I saw it in IMAX this. and everyone left in the French plantation yeah. scene to, do, to take a picture. It's just preachy. <laughs> They just come and preach to you about the ideas of the film and it just undermines the film so much. I think there should be almost be like a final, final cut where they <laughs> cut down that dinner, go bury him and then continue their journey. Apocalypse Now, uh, we're, we're really done this time, cut. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, well, I mean, I guess we should probably leave it there for this episode. I mean, I really kind of enjoyed this quite wide ranging discussion. I think next time we can maybe focus it more on specifically different genres or maybe decades of films and talk more specifically. But I like this overall general kind of overview of your of your kind of preferences. And I'd just like to thank you both for your time. And um, yeah, I hope to see you next time on the symposium. Cheers. Thanks. The Symposium with Ash Orlack.